Okay. Um, so today, um, the message that I came up with, I put a title on it, Reasoning with the Kingdom of God in Mind. Reasoning with the Kingdom of God in Mind. So about a month ago, um, I was just sitting with God and like I do, I just kind of read through the scriptures. And I came to um, Luke chapter five. Um, we'll start in verse 18. So this is a story that you're familiar with, I'm sure. The uh, Jesus had been teaching and healing people as he does. And um, the Pharisees were sitting there listening to him, of course. Um, and verse 18 um, says, then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring and lay before him. And when they could find, when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees who began reasoning, saying, Who is this who can speaks who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or say, Rise up and walk? but no, that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took what he had been laying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. So as I was reading that, all of a sudden the word reasoned jumped out at me. So uh, verse 21, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemy? And who can forgive sins but God alone? And then verse 22, Jesus said, why are you reasoning in your hearts? So I don't know, that, that word jumped out at me and I started pondering it, uh, reasoning, you know, and, and so not being anywhere close to an English major. And as I've said before, I got a solid D in English in high school. So, but for me, um, the word reasoning means to uh, think through and come to conclusions based on the knowledge that you have. You know, you, you take this bit of information, and that bit of information, that bit of information, you put it all together and you reason with that information and you come up with a conclusion. So the Pharisees took the, uh, the information they had, all the laws of Moses and prophecies and things like that, and they reasoned Jesus should not forgive sin. But Jesus said, why are you reasoning? Basically, in my, my thinking, it was like Jesus was like, why are you reasoning? Because you don't have all the data. You don't have all the information. You are just taking knowledge that you've learned on this earth, but you're not taking the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. You don't understand the spiritual world and the way it works. And so he was like, don't reason that way. Don't think that way. And, but he's like, okay, so just to prove to y'all that your reasoning is wrong and that I can forgive sins, he healed the man. So that started that whole train of thought in me for like, I don't know, weeks now, <laughs> where I was just like reasoning. So um, trying to um, bring my perceptions of life's events, things going on, um, and not just take my wisdom that I've learned through the years, you know, the situations I've been and how to solve them and how I've seen other people solve them but to take that knowledge and then join it with the knowledge of heaven that I've also learned over the years and try to put together um, a better way of reasoning, a better way of thinking. 
So, um, so the same word pops up. Um, I think. Sorry, lost my place. Luke nine. Oh no, not just there. Uh, but I would do want to talk about Luke nine. This is uh, Luke 9, uh, 11 through 17. This is when uh, Jesus again was teaching. He said, but when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. When the day began to wear away, the 12 came to him and said, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding town and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. And there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciple, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before all baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. The um, I love that story um, because the disciples like, I don't know what to do. You know, we can't, how are we going to feed this multitude? Uh, even if we go and grab all kinds of food from the nearby villages. Um, and so, Jesus blessed the bread and gave it to the disciples. And uh, every indication I've found is like Jesus didn't make a pile of food right there before them. And they just grabbed it and started distributing it. He gave them a little bit of the fish, a little bit of the bread. And as they started hand handing it out, it just kept coming and coming. So it was literally multiplying in their hands. So they could see that the miracle of heaven was flowing through them. It wasn't just Jesus. It was Jesus' blessings and his power flowing from heaven into them. And that, that was a, an amazing lesson, I think, for the disciples to, to catch <clears throat> that heaven, the kingdom of God, does work through them. It, you know, he and even today, it, he still works through each one of us. So then if we jump to Matthew chapter 16, verses 5 through 12, so the scripture says, Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourself because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets you took up, nor the seven loaves and the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I did not speak about you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees? Um, so again, uh, this verse seven says, and they reasoned among themselves. So they were taking data that uh, they had and they were putting together a conclusion. It's like, oh, it's not you know, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's actually talking about bread, you know, food, because we didn't bring enough food and he's ticked off at us that we didn't bring enough food. Um, and he's like, no, that's not it. You know, when you factor in heaven, when you factor in the kingdom of God and you factor in God's goodness and you remember the miracles that you've seen, then there's no lack. There's never any lack when God's kingdom is involved. We take what he's given us, whether it's enough or not, and the kingdom of God comes along and there is enough. There's plenty. 
So they, uh, they had to readjust their thinking um, by remembering what God had done through their hands, how they had fed a multitude. And I think in these stories, um, in, we take our reasoning, and whenever we come up to a place of lack, whenever we come up to a place of need, whether it's ours or somebody else, we have within our hands, through the power of Jesus, everything that's needed. All the provisions, all the wisdom, whatever it is that's before us, it comes from heaven into our hands, into our minds, uh, into our hearts, and then we can speak these things out. So I, I love just pondering the kingdom of heaven. And uh, I think that's you know one of the things that I'm encouraging us to do um, today and the rest of our life is just keep pondering how God can work through each one of us, how God can change situations because of us. So I want to jump over to Psalm 78, which um, is a long psalm, <laughs> but Psalm 78, verse 41, um, it says, yes, again and again, they tempted God. So this is talking about Israel in the wilderness. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy. So uh, again, I, what I'm pulling out of this one is Israel tempted God and they limited him, it, which, which is interesting because they forgot. They did not remember his power and all the miracles, signs and wonders he had done for them uh, in the forgetting of God's goodness in forgetting the God's provisions of the past, um, they put limits on him, which is kind of stunning. It lets us know that how closely God works with us when there's a need. Uh, if we remember, if we remember all the, the good things we've seen in our lives uh, are heard in other people's lives. You know, we don't have to actually be a firsthand witness of things, but we can actually take that information of what God does and mix it together and reason from heaven and come up with a conclusion that all things are possible. No matter how impossible this situation looks, all things are possible. And, uh, you know, if you're like me, there's always a situation <laughs> that needs God's help definitely needs God's help. Um, I think once we taste and see God's kingdom, we can always know it's available. Once we taste and see God's kingdom, we always know it's available. And so um, part of the challenge today is to remember all the good things God's done in our lives. So um, I wrote down this morning, it's like, I know, exclamation part. <laughs> um, nothing lost, nothing is lost that can't be found. Nothing is missing that can't be restored. All sickness can be healed. All, uh, all bad habits can go away. These are things I've seen in my life. So I um, wanted to share a couple of stories. One that I, I'm still kind of stunned and I don't know that I fully understand, but it's, it's really cool. So a few years ago, Lynn and I bought a, a new headboard <clears throat> for our bed. And, you know, it was like one of those Amazon things. You know, it comes in a box and you have to assemble it, right? Um, so I get the box and up in the bedroom and I'm like, probably not a standard guy. You know, I read the directions and I lay out all the parts and, you know, make sure they're all there. Um, and, uh, it looks like, well, I'm missing a nut. One little bitty nut. And I was like, oh, okay. It must be somewhere else. So anyway, I go ahead and start putting the bed together. Cause it's not a big deal. <clears throat> it's like, I was like, well, if I can't find it, I can always go get one. 
So I put the whole bed together and um, a lot of the parts were actually in a concealed compartment, like fabric on the back of the bed. I pulled it down. I searched that, shook it out. No nut, no nut. Looked through all the packaging materials. No nut, nothing at all. And uh, I was like, well, I'm down to this last thing. I'll, I'll just run over to Ace Hardware, which is about a you know, a five minute drive from here. So five minutes, the parts probably 10 cents and five minutes back, you know, no big deal. I wasn't upset. Um, and though I'm, I'm going to head over to Ace Hardware and I look down and laying on top of the instructions that I was just reading is the nut. Like what? <laughs> you know, it wasn't hidden in a fold of, of packaging. It wasn't like, tucked away in a, you know, a carpet or something like that and got lost. It was literally on top of the instructions that I had just been reading. It just showed up out of nowhere. It was like, uh, God, that's wild. <laughs> that's just like, and my brain's like, how in the world does that happen? I was like, I, I can't reason that one away because I didn't find it. It found me. It just found me. It was like, okay. So that's where I come up with this thing that I know that if something is missing in my life, God can bring it about. You know, if something is lost, God can restore it. Um, there's, there's, you know, it's, it's factoring those kind of crazy miracles into my reasoning, like when I come up with a situation and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? Remember the miracles. And then I won't put limits on God. Um, and so the, uh, the other story I wanted to share, excuse me, was um, when I was at uh, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. <clears throat> We went to this trailer park and, you know, we were ministering to this, this one guy. And, and I, I think I shared this story, but it's worth repeating. We went in there and he's, um, has a trailer, the guy, he has a teenage son and they, um, start, sh he starts sharing his story. So a number of years before that time, um, he had been in a, a car wreck at work and it damaged his back and his shoulder. And the doctors, you know, looked at him and examined him and says, if we work on your back, there's probably a 50% chance you'll come out paralyzed. So we just recommend that you live with this constant pain that you're in. Otherwise you could be in a wheelchair the rest of your life. So he had done that and then they couldn't, they couldn't heal his shoulder um, from the wreck either. So we prayed for him and, um, nothing happened <laughs> you know, at that moment. Um, and we came back the next week when we were visiting and he said, Oh, you know, a couple of days after you prayed for me in the middle of the night, my shoulder popped so loud, it woke me up and I've not had pain in my shoulder since that day. It's just gone. He said, but my back is still in spasms. You know, the muscles are knotted. And my son was just massaging them, trying to, you know, relieve some of the pain I'm in. So we, uh, we prayed for him again for his back. And all of a sudden, Jesus healed him. Like instantly. The, the, the big knots of muscles, the spasms, they were just gone. He's like, and he was like bending over, touching his toes. He's like twisting this way, twisting. It's like, it's gone. It's gone. You know, he's like, you can even feel my back. There's no knots in the muscles anymore. I was like, that was amazing just to see that kind of happen right before my eyes. But the, uh, the other part of this story that's so crazy is years before we met him, um, you know, he was going to church with his wife and his son, and it was mostly run by her family. You know, there are churches like that. Uh, and then, um, so one day he came home early from work and he walked in on his wife with another man. And, uh, it was like, I think another church member. And so he brought that before the leadership 
And they like, yeah, we don't believe you. We believe your wife because she's part of our family. So the, his at that moment, his faith got crushed and he gave up on God. He also, um, you know, left the church, obviously. And then after that event, I should probably tell this more in sequence. That's when he was in the car wreck. So he could no longer work. So then he lost his house and had to live in a little mobile home that he just really didn't like at all. Never thought he'd be there. So the, uh, the amazing thing about that story is like, you know, I think um, as a team, we went back and ministered to him many times after that. And after about six months, um, you know, when it was like our last meeting before school was up, he said, well, here's what's happened in my life since I met you guys. Um, my back is healed. My shoulders healed. So I was able to get a job. So now I can buy a house and get out of this trailer I never thought I'd be living in. And I met this, this woman. And it looks like this is going to work out. And she, you know, I'm going to propose to her. And I'm going back to church. You know, because he, he found out God is good. So within six months, his faith was restored. His marriage, you know, I was going to say restored, but a, a, a new marriage that was going to work out really well. A job, a new home. God worked all those things out within six months. And uh, again, that just kind of stirred in my heart. There is absolutely nothing, nothing that God can't do. When we factor in, heaven when we step out in faith um so it's one of those things we we remember all the cool things god's done in our lives or what we've seen him do page two Yeah, this, this is one of those things I, I believe in when bad things happen in our life. Um, they're, they're usually caused by um, we made a mistake and it affected our life. Or somebody else made a mistake and it impacted our life in a negative way. Um, or someone with evil intention did something that impacted our life and caused us pain or just we live on a, a fallen earth and just bad things sometimes happen so you know like a tornado comes through you know nobody caused that um but you know there are there are things that maybe nowadays corporations do that is like oh, it's all about profit who cares if we kill a few people <laughs> you know, uh, you know, um, but, you know, Lord knows I've made mistakes that have taken years to pay off. You know, it's like, whoops, that was bad. And then other people's mistakes. Um, so anyway, but God restores all those things. You know, I, I believe that he restores, he rebuilds, he creates brand new. He gives beauty for ashes. Um, so there's, there's always those things in mind. Uh, he gives us the power to partner with him to make things better. So I'm thinking of Mark 11, 23 through 25, you know, where Jesus said, if you say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea and do not doubt in your heart, but believe the things you say will come to pass. You will have whatever you say. And if you have anything against anybody, forgive them that your father in heaven may forgive you. It all flat falls together. Um, believing God, declaring his promises, forgiving those who hurt us. Those are the things that just makes, they're, they're kind of like the factors of the kingdom of God. Um, the kingdom of God is really close to us. You know, we, we tend to think dualistically, to use that, that term, where heaven is way up there and we're down here and somehow or another we've got to 
come together. Um, but heaven is actually right here. It's around us. Uh, it's He's not far away. And all we have to do is reach out and he's there. It's not like, oh, he has to traverse great distances. And uh, no, I mean, God lives in us, right? The Holy Spirit is in us. <clears throat> so he's here right now in each one of us. So there's no limiting factor. Really. <clears throat> we don't have to sit and pray. Um, so some people describe heaven, like I said, is, is right here, but some people can describe it as like just another dimension. You know, if you think about, you know, we live in a three-dimensional world where there's length, width, and height, right? <clears throat> so each dimension, the length, the width, and the height is 90 degrees to another. So when you'd have another dimension besides three, it's somehow or another 90 degrees to those three dimensions. It's all mathematical stuff that I don't really understand, but they, they said they can prove up to like 17 different dimensions mathematically. So what if one other dimension is just spiritual? You know, we have, so we as children of God get to live in the length, the width, the height of this dimension, plus we add the spiritual dimension, which is just right here. We just can't see it <clears throat> because it's, you know, perceived by the spirit. So um, just food for thought. That's something I probably want to discuss later on in more detail. Um, so um, Mark 9.23 says, all things are possible to those who believe. All things are possible because we believe. So that's the challenge for the day, for the week, for the rest of our lives is to factor in the dimension of heaven. We call it the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the spiritual realm, the supernatural, doesn't matter what you want to call it, but that is a dimension uh, um, in our lives that's absolutely real. And God will show us from time to time his goodness, through miracles, signs, wonders, and then it's up to us to partner with that, to remember those things that he's done. So thank you, Father, for this time to, to talk about you and your goodness and your kingdom. I release revelation over all my friends that they would know you better. They would understand your kingdom better. 